On Monday morning, rumors had emerged that Browns running back Kareem Hunt had been involved in some sort of an altercation outside of a bar in Cleveland. Those rumors eventually became video obtained by who else? TMZ of Kareem Hunt talking to police officers who seemed to be responding to some sort of an altercation, whether it was serious, whether it was horseplay between Hunt and a friend. It's unclear at this point, and it's unclear whether anything happens from here. But a couple of key points to keep in mind. Number one, Hunt has an eight-game suspension that he is due to serve at the start of this season for violating the personal conduct policy. And given that Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott back in New York on Tuesday to meet with the commissioner after his latest incident that we saw thanks to a TMZ obtained video of Elliott in the face of a security guard at a music festival in Las Vegas, the NFL will be more inclined to respond aggressively if the NFL thinks that someone who's already gotten in trouble has done something else that potentially constitutes more trouble. And that's where this becomes potentially fascinating as it relates to the Cleveland Browns because nobody knows what kind of arrangement the Browns created with Hunt when they signed him earlier this year, months after he'd been cut by the Chiefs. And the Browns may have said to Kareem Hunt, look, one more false move, and we don't care what it is. You don't even have to cross the line. If you just get in the vicinity of the line, if your name comes up in connection to anything remotely negative, you're out. If they put that strong of a restriction upon him as it relates to him getting involved in any type of off-field issues, this possibly would be enough to get the Browns to move on from him. Of course, they're not going to admit that to us unless they go ahead and cut him. They could be in this sweet spot where they told him that, but... Now that it's happened, eh, we're going to give him another chance because here's the reality. Talent continues to secure additional chances. And because Kareem Hunt was the NFL's leading rusher in 2017 and the Browns feel like they have stolen this guy off of the free agent market and he can come in and he can make a big impact for the Browns as they try to live up to their heightened expectations, maybe the Browns do give him yet another second chance, even though they may have told him when he was signed earlier this year, one false move and you're gone. There's plenty of discretion involved in deciding what is and what isn't a false move, and it could be that the Browns decide, given the lack of any hard evidence of any type of real misconduct and no evidence of Hunt doing anything that someone could argue he shouldn't have been doing, chances are the Browns are going to keep doing what they've been doing, wait for the eight-game suspension to end, and welcome Kareem Hunt back into the fold for a stretch run that could involve, ultimately, the first playoff appearance for the Cleveland Browns since... 2002 just up the road from cleveland is canton ohio site of the pro football hall of fame now in connection with the 100th anniversary of the national football league not the 100th season got to keep it straight this is the 100th season next year is the 100th anniversary next year they are expanding the class of hall of famers they essentially and look i, I they're using this occasion the combination of nostalgia and overall feeling good about football as an excuse to clean up some past messes, expanding the class of senior candidate Hall of Famers, guys who have been overlooked over the years who don't have the same chances of modern era finalists to get into the Hall of Fame. They're going to go back and they're going to basically hand out these golden tickets to guys that the voters believe they should have gotten in during the normal course of affairs. It's going to result in a huge class of Hall of Famers. It, it could result in a very cumbersome Hall of Fame induction process. And, you know, it's brought back to my mind something I've talked about recently, both on PFTM and P, PFTPM and PFT Live, and it's this. I think the bar needs to be higher when it comes to who gets into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I, I believe at some level there are very important business reasons that result in five modern era finalists, all of them getting in every year. When have we ever heard of a modern era finalist not ultimately getting in when you get down to the final five. They show up to consider 15 on that Saturday before the Super Bowl. It gets whittled to 10. It gets whittled to five. You get to the five, you're getting in. Because every guy that you get in, that's one less guy you have to worry about getting in in the future. And it reduces that log jam. You don't want to waste those five slots by turning one or two guys away and shrinking the size of the class because then that just creates even bigger messes down the road. And so much of this is processing these names, getting these guys that they think are good enough to get into the Hall of Fame, into the Hall of Fame, but always having that class of five. And what that does is when you throw on the, the other three now, whether it's two senior committee candidates and one contributor or two contributors and one senior, what it creates is this very robust and meaningful weekend of festivities every year in Canton, Ohio. And if, if you would set a higher bar that would result in 
three total members of the class, maybe two, maybe one, maybe not. Maybe there'd be a year with no Hall of Famers. What does that do to the Canton economy? What does that do to the level of interest at the Pro Football Hall of Fame? And I really do feel like, and it, should this shock anyone, the whole thing's a business. There is a strong business component to the Hall of Fame. And they are seizing upon next year's 100th anniversary as a way to take care of some old business and clean up those messes I mentioned to earlier where guys that they believe should have gotten in in the past under this lower than it should be standard of what is a Hall of Famer, all in the name of, of making that, that museum more attractive, making that weekend even bigger, and ultimately making more money for everyone involved. I hate to be that cynical, but I just I really do believe the bar should be higher. And I think the people who should get into the Hall of Fame are the ones about whom there really shouldn't be much of a debate. And uh, there's a lot of these close questions, and I think the closer the question, the less likely the person should be in the Hall of Fame in the first, pl first place. That may not be a popular take. That's never stopped me in the past. I, I just think that the bar needs to be pushed a lot higher. And for next year, they are definitely going to be lowering the bar to get in some names that they have failed to get in in the past. One guy who's destined to get into the Hall of Fame when he's finally eligible, and that would be five years after he last plays in an NFL game, would be Patriots tight end Rob Gronkowski. There's been a lot of speculation that maybe he'll come back and play during the season. Well, if he's going to be doing that, folks, Gronk better be ingesting plenty of protein shakes and all sorts of other calories and fat to put his body back together because this guy is looking downright svelte several months after last playing in the National Football League. I don't know, he looks 30 or 40 pounds lighter. So, you know, I thought there was a chance he would give in to the temptation at some point in October or November to come back and play. If he's looking like he does in that in that little clip that we just played, I, I, I don't think he's going to be able to give in to that temptation. He's already made the decision by shrinking his body to something far smaller than what we're accustomed to seeing. And I'm surprised he's done it because for whatever it is that this guy plans to do, Gronk being Gronk, I thought it was premised on Gronk being Gronk, which means not just this happy-go-lucky doofus, but a guy who's cut and chiseled and can flash his guns and can use that physique as a marketing device. We've speculated for a while about Gronk being the, the star of a reboot of The Terminator, which would be a great entry into acting for him because it entailed for Arnold Schwarzenegger about 17 total lines, most of, most of which were just a couple of syllables. If you don't have the body to pull it off, you're not going to be the star of the reboot of the Terminator and, you know, wrestling. And even if he's just a figurehead in wrestling and doesn't get into the ring, you, you want to see that Gronk size. You want to see that overall Gronk vibe. And it was kind of surprising to see how small he is. And it, it, it really, if anything, closes doors. It doesn't open them. And the one door it closes is that door of temptation that could lead him back to the National Football League during the 2019 season because before he could come back, he really would have to start putting some of those pounds back on. One guy who's been out of the NFL since the 2016 season, that's quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Look, I, I firmly believe he's never going to be back in the NFL. I, I think that the deal that was done to settle his collusion grievance, the magnitude of the payment that was made, it tells me the NFL is not worried about any further legal action. The NFL has no desire to ever bring him back, but he still has influence as seen by what happened earlier this week when Nike was planning to issue a shoe that had the original United States flag on it with the 13 stars, the so-called Betsy Ross flag. Well, Colin Kaepernick, who has had a very lucrative arrangement with Nike over the past year, and Nike has seen its sales increase and its stock value also climb as a result of the Kaepernick relationship. Kaepernick contacted Nike and said, can't have this. That original American flag too closely associated with an unfortunate era in America where slavery was rampant. And I, th look, for me, the Confederate flag, absolutely, positively, shouldn't see it, shouldn't be displayed. People shouldn't be riding around with it out of the back of their trucks. They shouldn't have it tattooed on their bodies. They shouldn't be wearing the T-shirt. They shouldn't be flying it because that has a clear connotation to some of the most unfortunate days of American history. But the original flag, that's a tougher sell. The original flag with the stars representing the 13 colonies. I mean, you could argue that Nike shouldn't have been selling the shoe with that flag on it because the flag's never supposed to be used as a peril of any kind. It's a more nuanced point that that flag harkens to a time in the United States where there were atrocities happening as it relates to the ownership and the treatment of slaves. But does that mean we shut down the entire 
first century of American history, or at least until slavery ended? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. My point is this. Kaepernick still has plenty of juice, and he exercised it by getting Nike to back off of issuing that shoe. And now Nike's got an issue in Arizona because the governor there isn't thrilled with what's happened, and the governor has vowed to take away tax credits for Nike, and it becomes a political football now, no pun intended, but you know that that's what happens. And some people think this was all a setup by Nike. I really don't think so. I think that the, the people there saw no problem with embracing American history and that original stars and stripes with the 13 stars arranged in a circle by Betsy Ross. I... You know, it's 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 not a mainstream thought that there's a problem with it. And Kaepernick's influence has pulled kind of a fringe belief into the mainstream. And Nike has agreed whether to what extent those agree remains to be seen. But for now, Nike has agreed. And for Fourth of July week, we have an issue that maybe nobody expected to become an issue during uh, this summer, if at all, in 2019. All right. One last topic before we go. 2019 is a target for the NFL to get a new collective bargaining agreement in place. The league would like to have it in place before the start of the regular season. I don't think that's practical. I think best case scenario is to have a new CBA in place before the next Super Bowl. But be that as it may, a term to get accustomed to, because you're going to hear a lot of it as these negotiations heat up and as proposals begin to be exchanged by the NFL Players Association and the National Football League. And the phrase is this, stadium credits. See, Ultimately, at the core of any CBA between the NFL and the NFLPA is how they split up the money. Now, before 2011, the players were getting 60%. That sounds good, but it was 60% of the net after the owners took a lot of money off of the top for all sorts of other things. Now, the players are getting, under the 2011 CBA, roughly 47% of the gross. Well, moving forward, what owners would like to do is take more money off the top to help pay for construction and and renovation of stadiums and the players look at it and they say well why do we want to be in that business the owners provide the workplace we provide the work why should we be paying with money that otherwise would be distributed to all players through the salary cap mechanism money that uh, is going to go to pay for the stadiums that's not our deal that's not our gig here's the problem the owners may be intent on pushing that issue aggressively enough that they would lock the players out over it so if the owners are serious about it and they want some allowance for stadium credits, what do the players do? Here's one way to look at it. If you're the players and the league expects you to chip in for the renovation and construction of stadiums, specifically as it relates to the construction of stadiums, the players need a say in where these stadiums are going to be constructed. That creates a, a, a fascinating new dynamic as we look at the game of stadium construction and whether or not teams will relocate if they can't get the kind of public money they want and does it make business sense to build a new stadium in a small market when there's a bigger market out there where everyone can make more money and and now should the players if they're going to be paying for the stadiums should they have a seat at the table when it comes to those deliberations as to where nfl stadiums should be constructed look at buffalo and folks I know Bills fans get very, very sensitive to any suggestion that there may not be a new stadium built in Buffalo and that the, the stadium where the Bills play at some point could be built somewhere else. But think about this. If the NFLPA is going to be expected to devote a chunk of money that otherwise would go to players to construction of a new Bills stadium, shouldn't the NFLPA have a say in whether or not that stadium is built in Buffalo or somewhere else? Maybe collectively, the players don't want to live and work in Buffalo. No offense to Buffalo, but if the players don't want to live and work there and they're partially paying for the stadium, maybe that ends up being a factor in how this all plays out. I, I guess my point is for the NFL, be careful what you wish for because if you want players to contribute to the construction of stadiums, you have to give them a voice. You can't just say, we blindly want the money and we'll figure out how to use it best. And if you do give them a voice, how do you keep them from basically hijacking the process and saying, you know what, we'd rather have a team in St. Louis. St. Louis is putting together some public money. It's going to cost us less and you less, and we're going to make more money in St. Louis because it's a bigger market than Buffalo. I, I think if you open that door, and the players become partners, not just in the sport specifically, but in how the sport is presented via that construction of stadiums. Things could get intriguing, to say the least. And 
all of a sudden, instead of what the owner wants, because that's what it's always been. What's the owner want? The owner wants to stay. The owner wants to move. The owner wants this. The owner wants that. If the players are kicking in significant money for these stadiums, significant enough money that maybe they would be locked out if they refused to kick in the money, and they get a voice, maybe players start dictating where teams are going to be. And the more I think about it, I, I wonder why it hasn't been that case in the past. Why is it? that the people who own the teams decide where the teams are going to be? Why isn't it that the players, the ones who have to live and work in those communities, don't have more of a say? If you expect the players to pay for a large chunk of the new stadiums that are going to be built, maybe they should have that say. And maybe this could get a lot more interesting as these talks unfold if stadium credits continue to be an issue. And I believe, based upon everything I've heard, they will be a major issue in this ongoing round of CBA negotiations that's it for today's pftot remember pft live is on hiatus until july 29 but i will be periodically bringing you video content from the site of pft live when we are back on the air and we'll be back on the air soon enough the pft pm podcast also will be fired up from time to time over the next few weeks and no matter what's going on profootballtalk.com every day multiple stories all the time even in a slow week we had a bunch of stories yesterday a bunch of stories today plenty of NFL news rumors analysis and everything else so we'll see you there and we'll see you back here again on Wednesday for another edition of PFTOT Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.